through chapters four and five. Um, and we need to be alert to what safe areas we have, always being aware of our obstacles to exits, you know, how we're gonna get out, if we need to get out, whether it's gonna be windows, whether it's gonna be doors, um, whether maybe fire escapes themselves, and just in nature of how to, how to get out. <clears throat> so we're gonna know the layout, we need to know our floor plans, and this is all stuff that we do if you have an opportunity. Remember we talked so a week or two weeks ago, we talked about going around our community and looking at these buildings that, you know, could be possibilities or So, obviously in the small town volunteer sector, we don't do a lot of inspections per se like they do in the full times, you know, Sioux City, stuff like that. They go around and, you know, they have an inspector and that crew goes around and they'll pull up right in front of your, your commercial building and they'll go in and they're going to give you an inspection. In our sense, the state really relies on our fire chiefs to do these inspections, um, pre-construction, stuff like that, so they make sure that that the fire codes are being met. Um, I don't know about Arms Park Local Clergy when I was in Milford, Milford follows the <coughs> fire code, state building code, so they make sure that they just followed all those techniques. And that's probably a lot of what the small town area is, is just following those fire codes, and that's the fire chiefs now on their shoulders a lot more than the state is, just due to manpower, um, not being able to afford to have that ability. Uh, if it's a large enough structure or large enough or something uh, of concern, then, then they can get called in. The state will actually come in and, and look at stuff like that to get done. That pre-incident surveys, that's that, that thing I was talking about, like I said, a week or two ago of going out and just doing size-ups of your buildings. Take a training night, especially this time of year. This is the best time of year to do it. There's really not a whole lot of outside stuff you want to be doing. Yes, we do fight fires in the winter. We just don't like to train them because it's cold and sucks. So do some pre-incident surveys. Look them up. You can find forms online to help you out, help you find your locations or your hydrants, what size hydrants you have in the, in the area, whether or not they're they're five to 750s or 750 to a thousands or a thousand plus, stuff like that. Because that's stuff you're gonna wanna know. Um, but you're also gonna wanna know about the inside layout, what type of exits they have, what type of fire structures uh, do they have a sprinkler system stuff like that you know personal observation um, I talked really early about taking a, a art of art of reading smoke class um, just so that you can pull up to a house and look at that house and almost be able to tell how it's laid out just by windows windows alone will tell you a lot about the structure and then what's up the roof you know you can kind of tell where maybe the living room is at based on windows <coughs> Stuff. So, and if you're if you're deep into it, knowing the architectural plans, that'll help you out, both commercial and residential. So there's a picture of the residential dwellings. So you know, obviously, we're going to take every opportunity we can to observe the layout. Uh, you know, observational. You know, you can see that right there is a residential. However, it's you know, you can look at it. Is it a, is a single dwelling? Might be just a very large single dwelling, might be a multi-dwelling situation as well. You know, but just looking at it right away, I can tell you probably, you know, you're looking at maybe a garage on the right side because of the door, because you've got a doorway in, a lot of windows over in this area. Um, tell me you're looking at maybe something like a, a living room or a dining area. Um, you know, you're looking at possible bedrooms back up on the right hand side there as well. I would guess there's some sort of fireplace in it based on its chimney location, um, being a new construction of that size of a chimney. So uh, other structural areas that you can have in your response area, commercial buildings, uh, hospitals, business districts, stuff like that. Uh, and then zoning meetings, open houses and building officials, they're going to all get together and they think they know what's best for them and for cost layout. However, sometimes I think they forget about the most important people and that's the people that gotta go in and be the first responders that are gonna be the ones that are ultimately there to save lives that their, their decisions may or may not cause us harm. The 
size up's a matter of safety for everybody. Doesn't matter whether it's us, whether it's EMS, it doesn't. So firefighters on scene, we gotta know what has happened to this point, what is going to happen, and what's happening now. And we take that as that first responder, that first person on scene, or that first truck on scene. And you may be the most experienced person on that truck, and you may have to be able to size up. And that person's got to give a size up. Um, most responding units, you get on the radio, you'll pull in, uh, pull up to a scene. I've got a single dwelling, uh, obvious fire, uh, looks like impingement through the roof on the CD corner, uh, hydrant location. So you've announced that over the radio. And then when the MFIC shows up, then you transfer to him if he's not there already or he's not the one doing it so that he has an idea of what you have, what is going on, and what you think or he may think is going to happen at that point. So it starts at arrival, just like I said. You know, quick situational awareness, what do you got? You know, something like this, especially this picture right here. You know, based on what you see right now, um, rundown shack, you know, the roof's fairly new. Um, the amount of fire damage that's already occurred, is that something we're going to run into? Or is that something we're just going to stay outside and put a show on? Stay outside. I'm going to stand out for a show on. Yeah. I got no reason to go in that whatsoever. You know, maybe set up a deck gun or, you know, a blitz, blitz fire and set the aerial up and put a show on. Right? You know, make sure it doesn't hit anything, any other outside dwellings. But that's something that you can use, your communication side of that. You could easily tell them. You pull up and you've got a, a large structure fully involved. Um, go to defensive attack. You know, we're not going to go offensive. We're going to go defensive. We're going to sit outside and we're just going to spray some water. Anybody who hasn't had a chance to handle a hose, that's a good time to, to let them have that chance. Yeah. Let them stand there, get a handle on that hose, let them play, let them spray some water, do a few different things. Learn some, you know, if there's a new technique that maybe you've, you've looked at or try or want to try, that's a good time to do those, you know. Um, we had that large apartment fire up in Spirit Lake. Uh, when was that? That was three years ago, four years ago maybe? That the, the big one was the APO beat Spirit Lake 2. <laughs> when was that? Two years ago. Was that three years ago? You know, I think I've told this before. I watched four Arnold's Park guys stand there for an hour with a two and a half in their hand, spraying water, just getting beat up. Because a two and a half fully run is going to beat you up. And it took all four guys and just beat on them, beat on them. I finally walked over and said, guys, I, I know, I'll take this for you. And it was me and another guy. And they're like, you know, okay. The first thing I did is I shut the nozzle down, put it in a queue, just curled it, sat down on it, opened it up, and I just sat on the hose. And what's something we'll teach you guys on how to use a two and a half is just to sit down and just Curl. It's something you guys may never have the opportunity to try, but you know, bonfires. Do you really want to stand there with a hose in your hand for hours on end on a bonfire? Or just sit down and spray water for a while. Listen to sounds that indicate the fire is becoming more intense. More crackling, more popping. You know, what colors of smoke? We just we discussed this a lot with earlier chapters. You know, especially in, in the watch your weather, but you know, in the normal conditions, you know, if we see some nice white smoke coming out of the structure, you know, what do we kind of expect is going on? Kind of getting a better burn, a good clean burn. But what if we've got some little, some darker smoke, maybe black, you know, or maybe if it's a puffy green smoke that's just kind of puffing out of the structure, what, what is our imminent danger at that point in time? Flash over backdraft, right? Feel the wall, the door with the back of your hand, you know, and we'll do this anytime you go to enter a structure, especially in search and rescue mode. Feel that door, top to bottom. Um, don't use bare hand, use your glove hand. If you put enough pressure against your glove hand, you're gonna be able to feel if it's hotter or warm or not. You won't be, it won't be hot, but it'll be warm. You know, a lot of times we used to teach that you peel that glove back and you put that bare hand on it. You know, well, you get used to doing that. The next time you do it, it's a metal door and it's hot. So 
you know, just use your left hand, that's just fine. So set on the floor before advancing. Um, something we've done on the roof, something we're gonna do now is as you're entering a structure, you know, if you have, you know, if you're if you got the tool in your hand, use the tool at your advantage and pound the floor. If you don't, just use your hand and pound the floor. Listen to it. If it doesn't sound solid, if it sounds a little hollow, you'll be able to hear it. Listen for sounds of structural movement. That's that creaking, that popping. Um, you know, especially if those plates, those str those truss str uh, straps start popping, those metal plates start popping. Look for and feel sagging supports. We don't hit into the middle of the floor that often, but if you're actually doing a primary search, you will move towards the middle of the floor. And if you get out there and all of a sudden you feel like you're kind of on an angle, be very aware that that's a structural support problem that you're gonna be dealing with, especially as we discussed with this new construction. <laughs> a new construction gives way real, real fast, burns really fast, so it becomes an issue of sagging floors. So the objective three is to summarize the safety guidelines for structural search and rescue. Risk a little to save a little, risk a lot to save a lot. Kind of all heard it in this, this kind of business before, right? If we, nobody's, if we know nobody's in there, is it really worth our time to go, or is it worth our life to go in there to save nobody? But on the other hand, if you're told that there's somebody in there, are we not going to do everything we need to do to try and pull a viable life out? Correct. Okay. Avoid extreme fire behavior. You have to remember that when you get in these situations, if it's too hot for you in full bunker gear, is it really survivable for somebody not? It's, is it an easy decision to make? No. Okay, first-hand knowledge. It is, it is the hardest decision you will make if you have to pull out knowing somebody's in there. Okay? So, does it suck? Yeah. Will you live with it the rest of your life? Yeah. But you know what? At least you're alive. Okay? Does everybody understand what freelancing means? Okay? We do things as a team. We work together. Okay? If you go in together, you come out together. Don't go in by yourself, run around, you know, think, you, think you're the almighty because you're not. <laughs> maintain contact with the IC. If not the IC, maintain contact with your direct, what we'll call right now is a supervisor. Um, as you get into the incident command structure, you'll find out that, you know, an, uh, an individual, me as, me as a person, if I was in charge of a group, if I was in charge of everybody here, and we had a task to do, I could not effectively lead all 11 of you. Okay, I would actually have to break it down where I would put Lance in charge of five of you and I would put Mike in charge of, or Lance in charge of four, Mike in charge of five to split that down because nobody can effectively lead more than probably five to seven people at a time and be effective at it. So when we say maintain contact with your IC, maintain contact with your, what we'll call your supervisor or your lead at that point in time. So if you're on an interior bat crew, and you go to the front door, you're gonna be you're gonna be tasked, somebody should be there, an officer should probably be there at that door to maintain contact with who's in and who's out. So as you go in, your your contact point is that person that you were at with at the door. That's who you're gonna to talk to. Let him or her have that conversation with IC as to what's going on when IC wants to know. Because he also needs to know as IC needs to know what's going on inside, what's going on outside, do we have water shuttles going, do we have this going? So he's got a lot going on. He can't maintain contact with everybody. So monitor your radio traffic and fire conditions because everybody may at some point in time hear something on the radio that somebody <coughs> important may have missed and that needs to be relayed. And we'll get into that when we talk a little bit about Maydays. Okay. And then cautiously, cautiously we're going to monitor those fire conditions. Everybody's tasked with doing that. 
um, not just the, the experienced people, but even the, the inexperienced people. Because the experienced people, we, we may tend to get a little blinded on. We think we know what's going on. I've seen this type of action before. Uh, this is just a minor fire or something, and somebody who's been in there maybe once or twice may see something that concerns them and need to flag that out. Accountability system, everybody should be using them, um, should have a way of using them. Uh, tag in, tag out, that includes from the point that you get on the truck to when you get on the fire scene to if you're going in to coming out. Obviously the perfect system is it works all the time. Does it? No. But we do the best we can to make sure that we can make it work the best we can. So obviously in our system, we have three tags, correct? On our helmets, okay? So we get on the truck, first thing we do is officer on the truck gets my first tag, right? Okay, that way he knows I'm with that truck. Because when that truck leaves, he should hang out, hand out tags before the truck leaves. If he has a tag still in his hand, somebody's not on his truck, okay? So once you get on scene, you've handed your tag over to your officer on the truck. You get on scene, you go up to the accountability officer, or however we, we choose to do that. We hand them a tag that, that way that person knows and the board knows that we are on scene. And then if you're going to do interior attack, you go to the front door, the officer at the front door, you go in. That tag goes to the officer at the door. You go in, the crew that comes out, they come out and they get their tags back. That way if something happens in the structure, I know, officer at the door knows. This is who's inside. So we're not wondering. Okay, well I think, I think Hawkins and Bell went inside, but I couldn't really tell. Okay, to, to be honest, you put that pack on, you get in a hurry, you know, your coat gets bunched up a little bit, you can't really tell the name on it, you didn't see the number on the helmet, they went inside, well, I think it was Hawkins and Bell. But you know, <coughs> you know, hand the tag over, we know, okay? Hawkins and Bell are inside, okay? Be aware of your entry and your egress points. Know what side of the building they're on, A, B, C, Ds. We're always, always in full PPE, STBAs, and have operating pass devices. Just for an insurance reason, if you are on scene and not in full PPE and you get hurt, the insurance company will have a fit. Does it matter to you? Not at that point, because you're hurt, but it will matter to your department and it'll matter to a lot of things monetarily. But for your safety, you know, whether it's you're in a full full fledged fire attack, you're doing haul overhaul, even in a car fire, you know, full PPE. Let's not take that opportunity of getting hurt. Work in teams. Two in, two out is the normal rule. Three in, three out is perfectly acceptable. Depending on the size of, and the hose that you're carrying, four in, four out may have to happen. Okay. It says use a strap to control the door. Um, if you don't have a strap, you could use door wedges. I've seen that. Um, I've seen guys that make these, these homemade door hooks that it's just a piece of angle iron that they bend one of the little corners in to put a hook on it and you hang it on the door hinge. So that the door just, it just sits there and the door hits it and it just won't close. I've seen those as well. Anything that you can use to keep that door open so that it's not closing behind you when you're doing search and rescue. Obviously, once we've cleared the room and we'll discuss this, then we want that door shut, okay? Close door to a fire and report that condition. Systematically, we need to do a search, okay? Systematically meaning if we're gonna go rules to right, then we always go rules to right. Or if we're gonna do rules to the left, always to the left. Okay. We don't go rules to the right through this room, come out and do rules to the left in the next room. We're doing the same thing over and over repeatedly so that we're always doing it the same, the same way. Stay low and move cautiously. Okay. Stay as low as you need to stay in order to effectively move throughout the structure. Like I've said before, if you can walk into a room and you can see and not visibly be heated up, stand up. If you can't, get down and do the one knee. If you gotta go full, all fours, go all fours. Obviously, fires change, something changes, we need to monitor that, we need to communicate that. 
We're going to talk about marking entries and remembering our directions. So we talked, I just mentioned a little bit ago about rules to the right, rules to the left. Talk about marking doors, putting the X's on the doors for primary search and secondary searches. How to make sure that whatever system you choose to use, whether it, if you're going to put just the X's, you're going to do primary searches completed, one slash through the door, secondary search does theirs, finish the X. Next time somebody comes to that door, if the X is completed, what do we know? Primary and secondary search is completed, correct? Okay. Maintain contact with the wall and lines of low visibility. So when we talk about rules to the right, when we go through a doorway, as soon as we come through the doorway, I immediately go right. Okay? And I'm going to follow that wall to the right structure I come to is always on my right side, right? Always maintain contact, whether it's with my shoulder, if it's really poor visibility, or if it's a little bit better on the visibility, if I can get about a foot out or so, and I can still touch it, okay? I'm a fan of staying a little bit away from the wall, and as I crawl, I hit the wall. So every time this hand goes out, when it goes out, I pop the wall, I go forward. So I always have maintained contact with that wall at some point in time. If I get to a point that that wall doesn't exist, stop, find it where it left, follow it up, there's the turn, turn to the wall. Same thing when I'm the secondary guy. You will find if I ever follow you, my biggest pet peeve is do not hang on to my foot. I feel like you're pulling, you're dragging, okay? So as I drag, as I'm, as I'm crawling behind you, if I can't maintain a visible contact, visible Visual, visual contact with you, I need to maintain a physical contact with you. I need to be physically touching you, right? There's nothing wrong to me as I crawl, same thing. As that hand comes out, I'll hit your boot. Hit your boot. Every time that hand comes forward, I hit your boot. Okay? I hit your boot. That way, when you're crawling, you don't feel like you're dragging because if we get out of rhythm, your foot goes forward if my hand's not ready to go and you're kind of pulling on my foot a little bit, that just bothers me. I don't like it. Physical or visual contact is what we always have to maintain when we're doing search and rescue. <clears throat> Remember with your packs as well, those lights are fairly clear to see even in really poor conditions. So you'll be able to see that, but don't just rely on seeing that. And we're always talking to each other, okay? Staff charge hose lines whenever possible. So if you have the manpower and you're doing search and rescue, if we can have another crew ready to do fire attack when you've completed a room search, <coughs> if you've got the manpower, that's always best. We talked a little bit about the ventilation side, that we don't do anything for ventilation until we're, we've communicated with everybody and we're ready to do it. Same thing with search and rescue. Let them know where you're at, if you're ready for ventilation or not. Okay, um, any rooms that we have not searched, we need to, and, and that's pretty obvious. Report any completed searches, and then keep the supervisor informed of the progress of fire. So this is a picture of what they consider a prepared firefighter. Known assignments and tactical objectives, so we know we're doing search and rescue. Um, he's got his, his tools with him alternate means of egress so he knows if he goes in goes in the a side of a structure he also knows that there's a, a egress or an exit on the c side of the structure okay fully functional pass device i think we've all experienced the the pass device in some realms whether we're not moving enough or we've accidentally set them off with the alert and if you don't understand how your pass device works um, Obviously, I think everybody, come on, you guys, we all have ISIs or Avons here. Uh, Armstrong, you guys are running the old Avons, aren't you? Which are pretty much the same as what we've got. Uh, Terrell, you're running ours for now. And then you guys are running Scott. Scott's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, you guys are pretty familiar how your, how your passes, passes light off and, and how to uh, hit the ignore okay. button. So. Notice he's got the accountability tags, he's got his radio. Um, know how your radio works in, in coordination with your SCBA as well. You know, um, 
you know, obviously with the ISIs, know where your know where your your speakers at, so that you can have your microphone held in the correct location. You know, a lot of times you'll see them pull that that's that mic up here to talk, and the speakers down over here. So, you know, Scotts, know where your guys' speakers are at in correlation to how your radios are going to work. New NSAs, those are a whole different story, but they're very clear on how their, their communication works through the radio. So, so let's differentiate between primary and secondary search techniques and then recognize any basic search methods that we have. So the first question we need to know is, do we have any witnesses who can provide any information about occupants that are still inside the structure? So. Do we have witnesses, yes or no? And do we have any, do we know if all the occupants have escaped? So no, so we assume the structure is occupied until we search it, okay? Yes, we have witnesses. Question is the witness, do we get everybody out, relay the info to the IC and the incoming units, and verify the information if possible? Can this change? Can we assume that everybody's out of the structure and end up that's not true. Okay, Hotel Fire in Milford. We assumed it was, it was. We assumed that everybody was out. We were going just to put the structure out, and shortly after we got there, we're informed from the con center because they received a phone call that there were three occupants still inside. Okay, they grabbed their cell phones. They called nine one one. Hey, we're still inside. And so it changed the whole mechanism of that whole situation real quick. Fire attack and ventilation improves our conditions when done simultaneously with search. And we discussed this a little bit about the ventilation side, that if we can, if we can simultaneously get this all together, that it'll improve our, our temperature conditions, it'll improve our site conditions. Doing that, if we can get that heat out and get some of that nasty smoke out, it's gonna improve our survivability conditions, and like I said, improve your visibility. need to decide when to begin the search procedure depending on what circumstances. Do we need to get the fire under control before we start the search or can we search while advancing a hose line? Remember if you're going to do a, a, a search while dragging a hose line it's going to slow you down because obviously you just got a whole lot more there to drag. But if we have that concern that we need to make sure we can get that fire under control possibly or maybe we know where the victims are at and we need to maybe put some fire out before we can get to them, then that would be a reason that we carry that hose line and advance it with us. And that's where that maybe four people situation would work, where two are, are tasked with the, the search and rescue part of it, and maybe the two others are tasked with the fire control or covering your six, you know. Two main objectives. Searching for life and assessing fire conditions. Because our number one number one objective in a fire is to what? Life safety, right? And then what? Property, okay? Primary searches are conducted in the most critical areas first. So in the most severely threatened area, the area where the fire is at, that's where we want to start. The largest number of victims or possible victims is where we're going to go to next. Any remaining hazards that we have, a second floor, uh, situations like that, that's our third. And then any exposures that we may have, if possible, we're going to go to last. Secondary searches are conducted after initial suppression and ventilation are done. The biggest thing about the secondary search is, first of all, who does it? Different. A completely different crew. Okay? It's not that we don't trust the primary crew, right? Let's be very clear. It's not that I don't trust what they did was right. However, have you ever done a job and then the boss says he wants you to go back and look at it again? And you go back and you're like, I know I did it. I already know I did that. Same thing in this. You go to a room, hey, I remember that room. I remember room number eight in the hotel. Yep, I remember searching that. 
Well, when the secondary crew doesn't know what you saw, and they're a whole lot more thorough about it, they're making sure that, yeah, you may have swept underneath the bed real quick, but they're going to take a full look underneath the bed, and they may move that bed, you know, or they may go into the bathroom that, or into the closet that you just opened up real quick and did a quick search because you were in a hurry, didn't feel anything, so you just continued on. Anything different, any, any changes that you may happen to come across, but obviously we do not remove our SCBA in this situation either. Okay, we're still in a condition, a hazardous condition, so we're not going to take our SCBA off because we really don't want to take that off until almost the bitter end. We're about ready to go home. So primary and secondary. Primary is what? It's quick, it's fast, we're in, we're out. Secondary is more thorough, it's a little slower, it's a different complete crew, okay? So when you're doing a primary search, you're going to go in, you're going to do a rules to the right, you're going to maintain a tagline or some type of communications with your second person, okay? Whether it be just by, like I said, visual contact or some type of physical contact. But if the room's fairly large, we still need to get into the middle of the room, right? So what's a good way that we can do that? There's a couple different ways. Tool. Use a tool, okay? Maintain contact, maybe that second person flows up to the other side of the guy, takes his tool and he sweeps out. Okay, what kind of tools can we use for this? Axe, use, halligan. You can use axe, a halligan. What's the biggest thing to remember when we're using a tool to sweep? Don't use don't, the... Don't use the axe end. Don't use the working <laughs> end, okay? Oops. Always use the handle end to do the sweep. <laughs> Swing that axe out there, you might hear a sweep. Yep, I found somebody. So, is it important as a, as a two-man search crew in the primary <coughs> search to have a tool with you? Because you may need to do what? You may need to use it. You may need to use it, okay? You might, obviously we, we're going to be sound on the floor, but you might have to breach a door, right? So that's something that, so we always want to have that tool with us. Have a strap with you, have some type of rope with you so that you have that ability to maybe expand your search from a wall. Okay, I carry, I carry a simple device actually. It's, I don't carry the big straps. I don't, I don't carry those um, just because they're so bulky. I don't like them. Um, basically mine is, it's a hook on each end with a rope that goes in the middle and then there's a ratchet system that you can pull the rope and it just pulls it, the, pulls the hooks together. I actually use it a lot for car extrication. So when I get to, when, I, when I've got a car extrication and I need to get a door open and maybe we don't have a tool ready or whatever, maybe the, the door is open somewhat and I want to maintain it, I just hook a fender, hook the door, take that rope and I ratchet it tight, pulls the door taut with my rope and then the door stays there. But I use it for search and rescue because I can hook it on my glove or in my finger my partner can hook it on the other end, and I just gained probably four feet of rope. So now he can maintain contact with the wall. I can be out four feet, so now I've expanded out into the middle. So I can search out here, and as we go, well, if we get to a point where we start to bend the rope, well, there's something between us. I come back to him, clear the obstacle, roll back out. In large room structures, okay? Secondary search technique. We still got our tools with us because we might need them. But like I said, it's more thorough. We're taking a little bit more time being methodical about it, making sure that we're searching completely underneath the bed, maybe moving the bed out of the way. Because um, kids, when they get into situations that they're scared, what do they tend to do? Hide. They tend to hide. Okay? So they tend to go underneath, underneath beds and hide. They think they're safe under there. You know, situations like that, maybe go hide in a closet. Um, a majority of the time, if you ever do end up having the, the unfortunate situation where you do find a victim, a lot of times you're going to find them either close to a door or close to a window. They get to that point where they, they know they're where they need to be, they just run out of time, they run out of air, they run, the, the heat just overwhelms them. So with kids, like I said, kids like to hide. They want to be underneath beds, they want to be in a closet, they want to be in situations that they can control, or they think that they're in control because they're, they're in a, what they consider a safe situation. 
So here's that systematic pattern, okay? Left-handed search pattern, you come through the door, everything maintains to the left, okay? Nice primary search, nice, nice and quick, okay? So the primary comes in, they do a quick search, sweeping out to the middle, okay? Making sure that we do what behind the chair? We're lifting on the chair and we sweep underneath the bed. Where's another area that we may not think of real quick that we may miss? Behind the door. Right behind the door. Good. It's two search teams, one on each one, one in one end of the hallway, one at the other end. Okay. Maintaining rules to the left on the bottom, rules to the right on the top. Okay, a one search team. Notice how he's always on the left. Left, all the way. Make the turn, it's still on the left. Everything stays to the left. Okay, that's what they chose to do. It's, it's, that's something when you go to do a search, you and your partner gotta discuss it real quick. Are we going left or are we going right? Because we need to know, right? Okay. If, Let's say the situation adheres to you, you're doing a large, so hotel style fire. Do the scenario. You know what room you're going to, okay? But you don't know where it's at. If you're close enough to maintain contact with each other, one of you on one wall, one of you on the other wall. If I can still feel my partner and I can feel my wall and he can do the same, you just go down until you hit a door. Hey, I got a door. Stop, check the door, is that the door we want? Nope, it's not, continue on. Check the door, hey, I got a door, is that my door? Nope, continue on, okay? As long as you still maintain contact and you're doing it systematically. You come to the door, we stop. You go to, you come to the door, you stop, okay? Getting low to the ground. Like I said, walk if possible. Okay, crawl in the extreme heat and smoke, whether it be all fours or if you can do the, the knee slide. And obviously if we're going downstairs, we always go downstairs feet first, okay? If you're in a situation where you can walk down the steps, which way do we go down the steps when we're walking with an SCBA on? Seems weird, but I will tell you, when the trailer comes up here, if one of the st other state guys comes up here, they will pound that into you. If you're going down the steps, if you have your SCBA on, turn around, go down backwards, okay? You have control of the weight because you can kind of lean forward. You know, their, their biggest fear is that you're gonna lose, lose your balance with that extra weight on your back so that you kind of may fall forward, so. Am I going to say that I always go down the steps backwards? No, I don't. Just saying, when you come to a stairwell with that CBA fully on, go backwards. Unless you're in a fire condition, then slide on your bike. Talked about this a little bit. Checking little areas they like to hide. So, doing our rules to the right, window, window, bed. How, <laughs> in a structure, if you're doing a, a, a room search and you're kind of lost about your wits at that point in time, you're really confused about where you may be in a room, what is something on the floor that you may come to that can help you tell where you may be, especially in a situation where you are in a distress area? that you may need to get out. What is, a, what is a key indicator on the floor that will help you know where you're at? Floor register might be under floor a window. Floor register, because they're normally under a window. Okay, you come to a floor register, most of the time, the window's right above them. Okay, that will help you when we talk about mayday calls as to knowing that you're at a window, I found a floor register, I'm at a window, you have a tool with me, I can break out that window if, if you have an idea in that structure where you're at, you know. Hey, I'm on the CD corner, on the D side, second story, 
I'm at a, I'm at a window. I see will inform me. Okay, do you have your tool with you? Yes, I have tool. My partner and I, you know, uh, we need a second point of egress. Let us know when you can break a window. We know you're at the register. You can break a window. Then you have your second point of egress. Superman. Superman. No, it was moving. <laughs> it's our first time I've had any animation work in this damn thing. Dial past usual. No. <laughs> this greased up slide crane. So they're their place and they're doing a two man search. They're placing that tool in the corner, point to point, so that they can reach out a little further. If it was me and I had a pipe pole in my hand, that pike pole, I'd have that working hand in my hand, my working end in my hand, and I'd be doing a sweep. So visibility is limited. Obviously, I identify objects by touch, chairs, tables, lamps. Don't move the object, it, it can disorient you. you know, search all sides of any object. You know, if you come to a chair, make sure we go all the way around the chair. You know, if you come to a bed, all the way around the bed, underneath the bed, on top of the bed. You know, make sure that IC understands that, hey, search is slowing because my visibility is going to crap. I can't see as well, so we're gonna slow down our search technique here a little bit. Things that we've already discussed a couple multiple times now. Maintain radio contact with either your supervisor or IC. Progress and new information. Close that door unless you're ventilating. And clear unused equipment with from the exit packs. Not only unused equipment, but you know, maybe the homeowner's a hoarder. You know, you come to a door. You know, you know that that's the C side of the structure, and that's a door. And there's bags of pop cans sitting there. You know, take that opportunity, maybe set them off to the side or, you know, throw, throw the door open real quick, throw them back out, and then close the door just to clear, give you that, that clear path of exit. <coughs> so there they're using. So they've got the third band at the door. So he's maintaining contact with them through, through audible or possible visual, and they're maintaining contact with each other, contact with the foot and the wall, you, excuse me, using their tools to help search. What are they doing wrong? Point the end. Binary search methods for large complexes, stuff like that. So, identifying tag, you know, your lead, your navigator, using a, a camera as well. Uh, steel ring tied with a search line. So that's stuff that that they do dive side, right? Do you guys have? Kind of for parallel searches, we would right. do it. So, same idea. You know, obviously this is something. Something here that you'd have pre-set up already. You'd have a tagline that's got the rings on it. So you'd stretch that out and then clip onto it and be able to do a, a larger search area as well. That's not something you just throw together really quick. But there are ways to kind of work with that. The webbing, the straps, stuff like that, that can help you do a larger search area. You know, if we were gonna, you know, in Arnold's Park over Boji, we really, we don't have anything that large that would require that. Air you know, ballroom. what's that? Yeah, the the hotels. Ballroom. Yeah, that Arrowwood Ballroom. Exactly. 
that would be an incident, especially with all the tables and everything else in there. That that would be an incident where we would need the, the ability to add that. So do we have the ability to? Yeah, we've got 50 foot rope bags, we've got 100 foot rope bags, stuff like that that we can use. Mar Maritime Museum and all that, the yep. roof garden. And yep. Yeah, I don't, especially with the new roof garden, you know. Um, you know, most of the time, we, those would actually be more of a prevalent area that you'd worry about than you would, let's say, Polaris or Pure Fish and stuff like that. You know, those ballrooms, especially with the table structure setups and stuff like that, you know, you know it, it could take one one slip of a, a little warmer burner, you know, tip over and catch the, the nice tablecloth on fire and it's close enough to a wall and you know, you could have a, a definite issue right there, and that's where you would use this large search pattern and have to come up with something pretty quick to do a good search technique. So this talks about the knots tied after each ring indicated the distance and direction. So you, know, you have one right at the beginning. You do one at 20 foot, tie a knot so that you know that that's the 20 foot, 40, 60, 80, you know, 100. So they one knot to 20, two at 40, three at 60. So every 20 feet they add a knot, and so on and so forth. Wide search area off ring. So he's got the rules of the right, but he's maintained the rules of the left. Tethered to the rope. So he's always got his way back, even though he's out in the middle of nowhere. What it will seem like the middle of nowhere. Maintain voice contact, went off the band search line, navigate, provide constant updates to the IC. So that, you know, this is where we're at. We're at the 20 foot mark, doing a search, you know, and that's, like you said, arrowwood, especially if they're set up for a wedding or something. At 20 foot, you may be right between two, you know, down a set of tables. You do your search out as far as you can, you know, maybe at 40 foot, you hit it again. Obviously, like I said, it's, it's kind of difficult because that's not something you just throw together real quick. It's something that's got to be pre-set up, but use what you got. You know, we already have rope bags. We've talked about, in the dive bags, we've talked about putting some type of marker in there, haven't we, Mike, about marking them? Well, you can, you can just use arm span and tie a knot. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we, do, we would do to mark the rope. It's just yeah. put a figure eight in it. Put a figure eight in it, figure eight on the bite in it real quick, throw a D-ring on it, and there's your, there you go. Using your thermal imagers can help you out as well, especially when it's dark, thick smoke. Do they have their disadvantages? Yes. Depending on the type you have, the year, the models, the age, you know, um, they definitely have their disadvantages. Um, one big disadvantage of them is if they shine towards a window, what do you see? Yourself. Yourself. Because it, it sees the reflection, and you don't. You think you're seeing something outside, and you're seeing yourself. Okay. Um, they have disadvantages because there's the the heat levels in them, and the, the way that they read the levels and everything else. They may auto change. So what you may think that you're seeing to begin with at different temperatures, you get a little warmer. Then your temperature ranges change, stuff like that. So if you if you have them and you haven't played with them in a while, get them out and play with them, you know, um, just to have an idea of what they do, how they operate. So they're getting more advanced. They're they're now starting to put them on SCBAs. So Scott, Scott's new thing now with theirs is it's in your mask. So you actually have a thermal imaging camera mounted to your mask, and the camera is just off to your right eye. So you can visually see in front of you, but if you look up just to the right, you can actually see through the thermal imaging camera that what's going on in front of you. Um, MSA actually has it in the what's the pass device. So you hold it up and you have a thermal imaging camera right in your hand that you can use, and then when you're not using it, you just put it down and it just hangs there like a normal pass device does. So, Consistent marking system. So if you choose to use the X marking system, primary search is done. 
one X, secondary search is done, finish the X, you're done. Okay? Whatever you choose to use, you always use it. If your department chooses to do something different, then you always do it that way. However, more consistently, the X's is the way that everybody chooses to do it. This is saying when you enter, when you exit. So if you go to make entry, you put the single swipe on it, you've done your entire search, the second swipe is done. So if another crew comes up because you, you're missing, uh, if something has happened, you've called a mayday, they come to this room, <coughs> they see that you're in here, then they know that this is possibly the room that you're in. Okay? If they see this when they come to a door, they know that you've been there and done that. Okay? So, how does this work if it's primary secondary? Primary does the first X, secondary does another color, and they do the second X or just the second X in general. So this is information that they use for um, mass yeah. casualty situations. So urban, urban Search and Rescue uses this a lot. Gives you all the information, the search team's name and number, when you did the search, as when you left, what hazards you have, rats. Right? <laughs> the rats are dead? Yeah, right? <laughs> the rats killed them. Right. So victims still inside the structure or no victims. So. Orange spray paint. Like I said, this is, this is something that they use for urban search and rescue, so you'll see it in mass cast catastrophe situations, hurricanes, maybe tornadoes and stuff like that. Questions about search and rescue? No. Something that should be definitely practiced. I think practice more than we maybe necessarily should. Um, I said I'll try and get the the if we could ever get out of snow and below freezing weather. Get the this the uh, SCBA trailer up here, the uh, breathing apparatus, the bats trailer up here. That works really good for search and rescue, just the techniques, <coughs> because you have to talk to each other. You have to, you know, that first person, that's why you, you just talk, you know. Maintain rules to the right, I'm gonna turn to the right. Oh, this fun. is what I have, I have a chair here, I have a lamp here. We're constantly talking. Yeah. And the second guy's constantly feeding back, you know. Turning to the right, turning to the right. It does two things. It maintains that comfortability level because we're, we're constantly in communication with each other. But it also does what for your, your air? You use less air talking than you are if you just breathe. Okay. So a lot of you may have learned the whole uh, skip breathing technique. Has anybody ever heard of skip breathing? No? Skip breathing was what they thought was, was the, the key to, maintain, to slowing down the amount of air being used. So what you would do is you would take it, you would inhale, you hold it for a little bit, inhale again, and then let it out. Well, you're still pulling air in, okay? Um, I have actually done this. Um, we've, you guys, Arnold's Park Road Gold just played dodgeball. And part of playing dodgeball, has anybody, have you guys ever done that before? Play dodgeball, softball, and, and pull SCBAs? you got to try it. It's a blast. But what it does is it, it helps you understand how your air is being used, how fast you go through it. You know, what you may think, you may think you do really well going through an SCBA, and you may think somebody's really terrible at, at conserving air, and you may find out that you guys are about the same. We played softball in Milford one night, and I kid you not, I talked, sang, hummed, whatever, the entire time, okay? I was the last one to run out of air. Everybody else was, they kind of talk every so often and whatnot. 
I was constantly, something was coming out of my mouth the entire time. Okay? It slows the amount of air that you're using down, you know, because it also keeps you calm. So let's go ahead and take a break. Let's go ahead and, um, you know, five minutes or so, take a break here.